Welcome to Zurich. Yeah. It's the sixth time I heard. Sixth show that I've done in Zurich, yeah. First one with House and Firth. How come? Just one of those coincidences, I guess. You, um, galleries open and close. I showed at the uh, Kunsthalle in 2002, I think. Yeah. Uh, the Kleines Helm House. Um, I was in a group show with my friend Urs Fischer in Glarus and so on and so forth. Uh, some commercial galleries and things. So, uh, what, what do you think of Zurich? As you I, I like it, you know, it's like, it's always been good to me. And uh, also I like the fact that it's nice and qu quiet and appreciative of the arts. And they've got the engineering science background in the background all the time. So it suits my work. I just saw some of your um, paintings here at Hausenwirt. And I saw a lot of numbers yeah, mixed I, with images. I, I come from an engineering background originally, but uh, I've always been fascinated in mathematics. It's, um, it's like the study of pattern. And to me, it's, it's very uh, compatible with painting. The two disciplines uh, have a lot in common, actually. Then also you have this fascination for computers, interconnectivity. Uh, when you were 13, you even took a computer apart. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but mainly because it stopped working, but I, I tried to take it back. But I, yeah, I, I'm from a particular generation, a bit like in the 20s with people that built their own crystal radio sets. I'm of a generation that lasts about eight years, where if you wanted to do computing as a teenager, you had to build your own computer from a kit, uh, unless you were very, you know, privileged, which I wasn't. And so, Instead of just understanding the applications, we had to learn the machine code and how the processor worked and things like this. And I think that's had a profound effect on the way I see the world, the way I think about thinking. It's, it's always been there in the background for me because it was this magical thing when you learned to program a computer and it wasn't like a calculator. It could, it could repeat things. You could use algorithms and you could compress even the most complex ideas into a mathematical language. The world has evolved with my work. So when I first started making work with machines and computers, it was kind of a bit geeky, nerdy stuff, you know, very, not very arty in the periphery. And the world seems to have changed and is like the work I was producing back then. You know, we have Google, we didn't have search engines when I was doing my art machine, for instance. So, um, so you're kind of a visionary. Uh, well, I wouldn't go that far. I would just, <laughs> I would go, I would just say that it, it, you know, my work's more maybe accessible or believable might be another way of putting mm. it because back then they actually didn't believe uh, that I possible. had these mechanisms that were coming up with ideas for me. They thought that was impossible, by, but no child today would question it. They would say, well, of course, it's easy to make an application that comes up with our ideas for you. How would you describe your paintings and your work? Can I, you? I wouldn't <laughs> describe, but, I, but it, if I had to, I'd, like in terms of painting, I try to think of paint like a programmable material, mm. a bit like Terminator 2, that thing that like changes form if it's touched it. And what fascinates me is the idea that, is the question of how does paint end up the way it ends up on any particular painting. If I paint a tree, for instance, there's a lot going on. There's the DNA that's formed the original tree I might be copying. But there's my own hand that might wobble for some reason. There's the reasons that I've become an artist, my parents meeting and so on. And this influx of all these different factors coming to bear on, on, on this substance. And then the substance moves and you have a painting. Mm. And I try to think of it as a kind of ritual or a process and you get these results. And in that, I sort of guess fill in that gap of trying to connect my work with something bigger than just my ego, you know, mm -hmm. which I don't think is particularly interesting as a... Uh, Why not? Artist. Well, I, I think it's, you know, an artist has to move from kind of catharsis and dealing with their own dirty washing to being contributory in some way, to contribute to a society and, and reflect the world they live in. And so I think you have to try at least to think about something other than yourself when you're making a, when you're making a work. Mm -hmm. What about your relationship um, after your piece has been done? Mm -hmm. What kind of relationship do you have to it? Like anything, I have favourites and ones that I think are less successful and so on. And uh, sometimes I'm sad to see them go if they go off to mm -hmm. some other place. Or, um, 
And one of the interesting uh, kind of um, neuroses I've suffered from a lot is to do with the, the work makes sense when you see a lot of it together because it's very stylistically mm -hmm. diverse. And when you split the work up, um, often it, it loses its context. And so I want to try and keep them all together. And of course you can't because you sell them or you, they go off to a museum or something. And so I, uh, I think that kind of neurosis and this idea of like lots of images and wondering how they fit together it reflects a little bit of society now with this deluge of images we're surrounded by and mm. how do we navigate Instagram and how do we put them together and keep them? How do we keep them precious in some way? Because there's just so much of it. Do you use Instagram? I do. I use Instagram. <laughs> um, I started using that a few years ago and I found it was quite a good way of... Uh, I tend to post something once a day saying this is what's going on in the studio or something like that. And, um, but I, I use it more to see what other people are up to than I do for yeah. advertising or something. Uh -huh. well. Seek inspiration as well? You I mean, mean, do it's do almost... I steal things? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw that uh, in your time machine, right? You have yeah. Snoopy there. Yeah. Then you have this other piece, um, Big Data. Yeah, yeah. With uh, half half of it is a rich Chinese guy. Yeah. And an random African person. Yeah, I found a painting in a shop, which was an unknown guy, just a kind of thrift store painting. And uh, that piece is, is to do with a lot of different um, kind of data sets and information systems that are behind that painting. Mm -hmm. So you've got the DNA of the of the particular individuals in the painting, the coincidence of me finding the painting in the shop and copying the style of the unknown artist. But also the way I've tried to represent the information that's in the painting as a field, which, which everybody would actually exist in somewhere, uh, like a, as, a, as a square space. And I like the combination of mathematics, aesthetics, portraiture, surface, that's it. it's that collision that I find exciting in a piece like that and um, the ways in which we try to categorize the world mm -hmm. into like you know racial groups or, or whatever it might be when in fact the world is just like a big complex interacting dynamic if you would have to set yourself within that square where yeah. would you be I'd, I'd be somewhere above anonymous, but <laughs> <laughs> below ultra famous and slightly more towards the Eurasian than the African, I guess. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, somewhere in the middle mm. there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Which one of, your, uh, of the paintings here at the gallery is your favourite one and why? Mm, I can't tell you why, but my favourite's the little telephone, the mm -hmm. WE2750 series. Uh, that whole room has little bits of technology. There's a self-portrait with an iPhone, and it's the idea that these technologies, when you see a Nokia brick or an old digital watch, an alarm clock radio or a CD player, you remember a time when you used those things, and they've become our markers in time. So it's a kind of very nostalgic room about how quickly technology becomes defunct mm -hmm. and a nostalgic... Uh, you know, throwaway item. Mm. And it's much more rapid than it's ever been. You know, they've, you, you look at an old iPod, which is very recent, and it just looks like an antiquated device. You, mm -hmm. know? you were also honoured with the precious uh, Turner Prize, which is a uh -huh. British um, art award. Mm -hmm. How did that prize change your life? Um, well, if I'm perfectly honest, it, it didn't really change it in any way other than I guess financially, you know, like the prices of my work and things went up and, and that gave me more opportunities to show and things like that. I, I found it a little difficult because I think I was a bit young and wasn't quite ready for... It was in uh, 2000... Two, yeah, it was a long two. time ago now. It was 2002, I think. And um, I, I don't think, you know, if you get that level of success very early on, you're maybe not, you haven't quite worked out um, how to be kind of centred. Mm -hmm. And so I found, I found it a little challenging, you know, all that attention suddenly. Uh, it was quite a big deal back then. It used to be on the TV and you were on the front of all the newspapers. I'm not sure it's quite, you know, 
It's not like the Oscars or something. Yeah. But it's, it's got... It's it, the art Oscars. So, I can tell you this, I've never seen my name without Turner, Turner Prize. Prize after it, so it's altered things that way. Does that annoy you sometimes? Yeah, yeah, sure. But not because I, I'm very grateful to that, I, that I won the prize and, and it helped me in all sorts of ways. But, um, yeah, you're more than... I feel that you're more than one particular award you're given. You know, your, your practice is 35 years long and complicated, you know. I also have some personal questions because yeah. I saw that you changed your name. You yeah. adopted uh, the name of your stepfather. Yes. Why uh, that? Uh, well, I didn't have much choice in that, unfortunately. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I left school early was because my stepfather made me uh, go into a shipyard. I was from a very working class family. And so I had to work on Trident submarines, nuclear submarines, for five years. I uh, hated it. <laughs> How old were you then? 15. And um, so I did a five-year apprenticeship. And the, the problem was I was artistic and I wanted to be out of there. But, you know, if, if you're in a very a kind of working-class poor family, you have to do what the guardian that's looking after you says. And he said, go and learn a trade. If you've learned the trade, you can do what you want. Mm -hmm. Might not have said it quite so nicely, but <laughs> that was what he said. And so I did it. And... Um, Interestingly, I think it gave me a little bit of an advantage at college because the idea of writing an essay, for instance, was a walk in the park mm -hmm. compared to waking up at five o'clock in the morning and making 25,000 washers for a nuclear missile tube or something. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's why my name was changed. And my real father, I didn't meet till I was about 30 and done a lot of therapy. And so then I, I met him. Oh. Okay, so is art somehow also your way to... Yeah, I think most people who are artists, if you scratch the surface, originally they did it as a kind of cathartic exercise. It was, you know, they couldn't get a girlfriend, they were alone in their bedroom. <laughs> Whatever reason, they were good at drawing. Um, maybe not, but in my case, certainly, I, I, it was a way of dealing with the world, and still is. If I didn't have my work... I think I would struggle with depression and things like this. It, it, it gives me an, a, a place in which I can explore things without so much pain. You know, mm -hmm. I can feel that I'm doing something positive with it. And when, when did you realize that you were artistic? In primary school? I yeah, so the first prize I won was not the Turner Prize. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I won a prize when I was 11, an art prize. And I was flabbergasted. I remember thinking, well, why have they given me it? And I, and so they told me I could draw and things like this. I had a very good teacher who said, it's not about moving your hand, it's about looking. And uh, there was a radiator stop tap on a heating mechanism in the school. And he was asking me to draw it and I was drawing a circle. And he was saying, look, it, it doesn't, it's not really a circle, it's another shape. And, and then I began to draw this ellipse and realize that things are not the way your brain sees them. But then you extend that philosophically and emotionally and you realise that you can look. It's all about looking. You know, any, when, you, when you go to art school, they teach you to look. Mm. And the brain takes shortcuts all the time. It, always, it thinks it knows what the world looks like and the way people behave. But in fact, if you just slow down and look, that's why it's a bit like meditation or something, you begin to see things. And that's, to me, what an artist is. It's... it's an artist is somebody who looks at the world just that little bit more um, intensely and reflects that back to us. So you mentioned um, this teacher who mm. gave you that prize. Mm. Was that, that was somehow very encouraging. If you say you came from a working family where maybe art wasn't really being appreciated that much. Yeah, yeah. I, I think education is, you know, the the most essential thing in the society. It's, it's, the, it's the real um, factor in social mobility. It's the real factor in, in kind of making a, a fairer society. It's all about education. And that's the point at which, uh, you know, human beings are malleable. Where, and a tiny bit of encouragement, a droplet mm -hmm. of encouragement, mm -hmm. even in the most abusive of circumstances, can make a dramatic effect on that person's life. And I've seen it again and again, you know, not just in my own life, but in other people's lives. 
um, you know, a teacher coming in and just making a change in the student's life can be huge. Mm. And of course, they don't know what's going on behind closed doors. So I think it's the most important thing. Thank you.